at the time I had a, a driver. And so I'm sitting in the back and I got this email from my business partner who was basically telling me that they were cutting me out. So I'm like reading this email on my phone and I got stuck in a big riot during those municipal elections. And there are people throwing cherry bombs and they have fire on sticks and picket signs. And it was just crazy and hectic. And the next thing I know, the driver, he just gets out of the car and joins the riot. And so I climb over into the front seat, the key still in the ignition, and I just drive away. is The Maverick Show, where you'll meet today's most interesting real estate investors, entrepreneurs, and world travelers, and learn the strategies and tactics they use to succeed. And now, here's your host, Matt Bowles. Hey, everybody, it's Matt Bowles. Welcome to The Maverick Show. My guest today is Kristen Wilson. She is a location independent entrepreneur, writer, public speaker, content creator, and full time digital nomad. She has lived and worked in over 60 countries in the last 15 years and has helped over a thousand remote workers relocate worldwide. If you missed the last episode when Kristen was on the Maverick Show, check that out for sure. It's episode number three. And we went all through her background in international real estate, as well as her location independent entrepreneurial journey. Today, Kristen is focused on helping people become digital nomads through her courses, programs, workshops, and speaking engagements. She consults with companies and individuals on how to prepare for remote work assignments and relocate internationally. She is the founder of Digital Nomad TV on YouTube and host of the Badass Digital Nomads podcast, and she documents her own location-independent lifestyle on her travel blog and personal channel called Traveling with Kristen, which is also being syndicated on streaming services such as Hulu. Kristen is also the creator of the 30-Day Digital Nomad Challenge, and she is the author of the forthcoming book, Digital Nomad 101, The Ultimate Guide to Location Independence. Kristen is a top writer on Quora and Medium on the topics of travel, digital nomadism, and location independence. She's been featured in Bloomberg, Business Week, ESPN, The New York Times, Huffington Post, House Hunters International, and many, many podcasts, including episode three of The Maverick Show. Kristen, welcome back to the show. Thank you for that amazingly warm welcome, Matt. It is always such a blast to have you here, and it's so fun to hang out. Now, we are not actually doing this in person today. Uh, the last time we saw each other was Brazil, I believe. We were hanging out in... That was about December, and you actually interviewed me for your podcast, Badass Digital Nomads, in person, which was a blast. Do you remember where we did that interview? Yeah, in like a random street in Puerto de Galinas. <laughs> it was like we were. It was like a block from the beach, and it was like I don't know, ten o'clock at night or something. And we, and you, it was a video interview because you were doing an audio and a video podcast. And we were like walking. We had been trying to schedule it, and then that, ten p.m. was like the only time we could do it. And then we were like wandering around, and we're like, you know what? Let's just set it up right here in this alleyway. And, and then we just set the, all the video stuff up and just like shot it in an alleyway. But it was uh, really, really an awesome interview. And so I feel like that was the last time that we saw each other, though. And now I am currently in Cape Town, South Africa. And where are you today? I'm in St. Augustine, Florida. Awesome. Yeah, you're just doing a quick trip right through the U.S. Uh, before you are off to your next set of adventures in a couple of weeks, right? Yep. Um, since we were in Brazil, I, would, I went to Buenos Aires after that, which you gave me a lot of travel tips for. So thanks for that. I think I... I hit all of the, the important stuff, which included eating and drinking. But um, after that, I basically went, I came back to Florida for a couple days for a wedding. And then I went back to Europe and have been there ever since. So I'm just passing through 
to just do some work and visit family. And I haven't really been home in a couple of years. So just came to hang out for a little while before I go back to Europe. And I will be headed to Paris in about two weeks for the uh, Rolf Potts Travel Memoir Paris Writing Workshop. That is completely amazing. And for people that don't know who Rolf Potts is, I mean, the first thing that I'll say about him, and then you can share a little bit more and where I came across him is that anybody who's read The 4-Hour Workweek by Tim Ferriss, which both you and I read in 2007 when it came out, by the way. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Tim Ferriss extensively cites Rolf Potts as his inspiration uh, one of his primary inspirations for writing the four hour work week, um, and Rolf Potts's book Vagabonding, right? The, um, about the art of long-term world travel, which I have also read both the book and listened to the audiobook, And, you know, it w- has also been very, very inspiring for me. So that's amazing. First of all, that you're going to meet Rolf Potts and that you're going to attend his course. Can you talk a little bit about w- what that is and w- what he means to you and how you decided to do it and, and what the course is going to be about? Yeah. So actually I found out about Rolf Potts through Tim Ferriss in the four hour work week because I think when vagabonding came out, I was already a vagabond. So I was out in the world with like definitely no smartphone and no internet connection most of the time. So I was unaware that that book even existed until after I read the four hour work week. So I kind of found out about him in a backwards way. And ever since, I've just been just kind of like casually following him online. I actually was looking at his books on Amazon because I thought I need to brush up on my Rolf Potts. Like I've, you know, I've listened to some of his podcasts and I've read um, his essays and just a lot of stuff that he's written over the years, but I haven't read a lot of his like full length books. So I was thinking I might get some for the plane ride over. And, you know, I feel like Tim Ferriss and Rolf Potts are like, kindred spirits because we come from the same generation. Like we're all about the same age and we all are obviously passionate about travel and lifestyle design and entrepreneurship. And so I just always felt like we had a lot in common. So I really related to them, even though they don't know me. <laughs> but um, the, the writing workshop, I think he's been doing them for 10 or 15 years. So I've been aware of the writing workshops for a long time. But At the time, I was really busy with my business and I wasn't doing a lot of writing. So I couldn't really justify going to a writing workshop, except that I used to be a writer when I was in college. So now that I am actually writing again and have been writing online and wrote a book and I write every single day now, anywhere from like a thousand to 10,000 words, like (laughs) something crazy like that. So it's just really become a part of my daily life. And I thought this is the year that I'm going to go do that because I love Paris. I love France. And there really isn't anything that I would rather be doing than learning to write better about my travels from Paris through Rolf Potts. So it just seems like kind of a match made in heaven and I couldn't pass it up this year. That's amazing. I'm so excited to hear how that goes. I love France as well. I was there last summer. I spent about five or six weeks going through the French wine country and actually took a bunch of your recommendations. Uh, you sent me out to uh, Saint Emilion in Bordeaux and uh, gave me some amazing recommendations there. And so I feel like for me, I had only really, I'd been to Paris before and I'd been to the south of France, but I'd never been through the different wine countries in Bordeaux and Burgundy and those kind of places. And it was just a truly spectacular experience. So I agree. Paris, I love. And also now the rest of France has just significantly moved up my list. And uh, it's really, really an amazing place. So I'm super excited you're going to do that. What have been some of the other things that you've done since we last talked uh, earlier this year? I know you were in Europe and you you produced some, you know, some really solid travel content. What were some of the highlights of your year so far in 2019? So my number one goal this year was to finish the manuscript for my book, Digital Nomad 101. And last year, I kind of came out of the gates running and I wrote some articles about how many goals I had in the year because I had been running my online business by then for six or seven years. And I really was excited about all of the new ideas that I had and transitioning into a little bit of a different type of business. 
So going from relocation consulting to more of a brand building and media company and uh, a thought leader for the remote work industry. I like to call myself a cheerleader for the digital nomad movement. So last year, I had 100 goals in 180 days that I was trying to accomplish, which I think I did a pretty good job at it. But one of the things that I learned through that process is that you can get also a lot done if you have a very small number of very important goals. And so I decided to shift strategies this year. And instead of going for a lot of smaller goals to only limit my number of goals to anywhere from one to three goals per quarter. And actually, I got that from Michael Hyatt because I use his full focus planner and full focus journal. And his team actually recommends only doing one or two main goals per quarter. And so my number one goal was to finish the manuscript for my book. And I decided to leverage my ability to be location independent by choosing my environment for writing that book. And one of the best places for me to be productive is Bulgaria. So I went to Bulgaria for two months and all I did was snowboard and write my book. (laughs) So every morning, snowboarding and writing and then working in the afternoon. So it was a blast. I snowboarded 30 days. And then after that, basically my way of celebrating finishing the manuscript was going to the French Alps and just partying for two weeks. So I did that. I went to Um, Tomorrowland Winter, which was the first Tomorrowland music festival in a ski resort. And that was in the French Alps. And then I went to a one week long bachelorette party in Courchevel, which they call the oligarchs playground. It's like one of the most expensive places I've ever been, but it's beautiful. And that is just a couple hours away from where uh, Tomorrowland Winter was. So more skiing, more snowboarding, lots of rosé. And after that, I went back to my home away from home, which is Amsterdam. And I've been there ever since. And then I just got back to uh, Florida a couple of weeks ago and then preparing to take off again. That's awesome. Well, I remember you and I were crisscrossing, barely missing each other because I went to Bonsco on the very tail end of the ski season right after you had left. And then I went, that was right after I went to the ski week, which was in the Austrian Alps. So you were in the French Alps, I think, while I was in the Austrian Alps, and I had just missed you in uh, in Bulgaria. So we were super close, kind of crisscrossing this year. Hopefully, our paths will cross because you're doing some really cool stuff too. After the France uh, uh, experience, you're then going to go up to this Arctic Lodge. Can you? I've never heard about that literally before. You told me about it. Can you talk a little bit about what that is? Yeah. So. Um, I wrote an article called, Is Co-Living the Future of Housing? And this was about a year ago. And these guys sent me a message. They're like, oh, we really liked your article. Can we share it? And I was like, yeah, sure. And I looked at you know where they were from and it said the Arctic Coworking Lodge. And I'm like, where is that? Because that sounds really cool. I'm being from Florida, you would think I like the beach, but I do. But I'm also really obsessed with cold weather for some reason. Like I really like going to northern places. And so I looked at it and I saw that it was a co-living space in Lofoten at the northern, northern part of Norway, which is somewhere I've always wanted to go. And when I went to Norway, I went to Oslo and Bergen. And going up to the north is like a whole separate trip. So you really have to have that planned out. And it's not like you just jet up there and then come back in a couple of days. Like you want to be able to stay up there for a while and really experience it. So it had already been on my list. And I was like, wow, this is combining all of the things that I like. So on another level, besides the Paris writing stuff, I love nature. I love hiking. I love snow. And you can surf up there. And I used to be a you know competitive surfer. And it's co-living. So it's like digital nomads, in nature, in this cool spot. And I told them I'm going to come up there sometime. So I booked a month and I wanted to go last year, but it didn't really line up. So this year I was like, it's definitely happening. And yeah, so I put my deposit a few months ago and I'm, I'm going there. I'm so excited to follow your experience there. I will be watching very closely and super excited to see everything that you experience because that does sound like a truly, truly epic experience. 
So let's talk a little bit about the book. I know that that has been really a primary project that you've just been grinding on day in and day out relentlessly and just really putting in the work and effort, uh, both in the research and the writing and, and everything else. It's been very impressive to, <laughs> to know you as well as I know you and to see how hard you've been working on it. So I'd love for you to just talk a little bit about the book and maybe just start with what it's about who it's for, you know, what it contains, and then maybe we can talk a little bit about your writing process. Sure. So it's called Digital Nomad 101 at this point in time. And it's an idea that I've had since probably, I've been wanting to write it since 2015, but it was before I had my brand of traveling with Kristen. And it was before I really knew how I was going to help people become digital nomads. So I learned the term digital nomad in 2013 and realized that all of my clients were digital nomads, basically. And I was like, wow, I can help all of these other people become digital nomads too. But there's only so many hours in a day, so I can't really help them one-on-one. So what is the next best thing? And it's writing a book. So I've always wanted to write a book about anything, really. I've In college, I had a whole manuscript called The Surfer Girl Diet, because I was really into surfing and health and cooking and like making healthy foods. So I created this whole cookbook basically called The Surfer Girl Diet because I worked at a sports management agency as an intern. And people were always asking me like, how do you get in such good shape and blah, blah, blah. And how do you stay in good shape for surfing? So I wrote that book. So I actually never published it because I ran into all these problems about calling something a diet and like health. (laughs) I don't know, all of these regulations and it never got published. But my whole life, I've always really had like a natural affinity for writing and reading over math, for example. So it's kind of always been inside of me to write. And um, I used to write for different websites and things like that. So I was like, I'm going to write a book. And it was just a matter of time. I mean, in a perfect world, I would just be a writer. (laughs) And I probably will end up doing that at some point. But um, this book specifically is meant to be like a digital nomad Bible. So it's going to have everything in it that you need to know to be a digital nomad. So it's, it's split into five different parts. And it starts with the history of remote work and digital nomadism, and also the mindset of being able to work and travel and live life on your own terms. And then it has other sections about remote jobs and online businesses and how to start your own business, how to create your digital nomad job. And then it has a whole section on travel and also community. So it's wrapping everything together from the moment somebody figures out what a digital nomad is and what the capabilities or what their capabilities are through actually doing it from the details like budgeting and getting rid of your stuff and things like that through actually going through that transition and sustaining the lifestyle long term. Because becoming location independent is it's a lifestyle shift and it's something that you can do on your own for sure. But it really helps to have just take the wisdom and knowledge of people who have already been there because there's so many opportunities to make mistakes and waste time and waste money. And that's going to happen to some degree anyway, anytime that you're working for yourself or traveling around the world while working remotely. But that's, you know, that's going to be part of the learning process. But I mean, for everything we do in life, we want to find the best way to do something. And so this is going to be a guide for that. And so it's like a practical guide, but it also has like this element of like philosophy and just like the bigger life picture of what it's about and what it means to be a digital nomad and how people can really take advantage of that and thrive in the lifestyle long term instead of trying it out, you know, taking the leap, as they say, jumping off the cliff with your one-way ticket to Bali and hoping it works out. Just really giving people a practical guide that they can refer to whenever they have a question about the lifestyle, whether it's financial or has to do with 
like mental health or friendships and relationships, they can just go to the book and and look at the section that talks about that and just get a little bit of um of a foundation or perspective there from not just me, but other people who have been through it. So I have a lot of stories about what um, other people's experiences have been to just kind of illustrate each point. And actually, I reference your story in there too. <laughs> That's amazing. I am so excited to read this book. I do not have a copy of it yet because it hasn't been officially released, but I understand that it is available uh, for pre-sale and that the listeners of The Maverick Show, we can put a link in the show notes and that they can go and get on the pre-sale list to get an early copy of the book as soon as it's ready. Yeah, for sure. Yep. There's a, there's a waiting list. Amazing. So we're going to put the link in the show notes for how you can be first on the list to uh, be able to get a copy of that as soon as it's available. That's awesome. One of the things, Christian, that I've always appreciated about you and your content in this regard is that you have really been one of the people that's focused on how to do this in a sustainable, long-term way. Right. And I feel like a lot of people, you know, it's it's a very like like most things in life, right? <laughs> the things that are kind of like promoted are like the short term, kind of like, oh, hey, come in and sit on the beach with your laptop and like have this, you know, Instagram picture and then like boom. But then like what about loneliness over time? And what about dating and relationships? And what about, you know, uh, you know, sustaining all these different types of, of, of real life needs? And I feel like you have been one of the people that has given very, very serious attention to that. And one of the things that you've done, which has been amazing for me to have participated in and be a part of is that you've formed the long-term digital nomad success group on Facebook. Um, it's a Facebook group, which now has thousands of people in it. And I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that, because I, th I think that's been just a, an incredibly significant contribution that you've made in terms of creating and facilitating and running that group. But can you talk about you know, what that group is all about, what it offers, who's it for, and why you created it, and where you're, where you're taking it? What's your vision for that group? Yes, you really hit the nail on the head because anybody who's been on Instagram or Facebook lately has probably seen some ad talking about how you can get paid to travel the world. And it's just, you know, a bunch of hype to get people to pay for maybe products or courses that are like get rich quick or quick fixes of some kind. And you know, I think that this is a really opportune once in a lifetime moment in history where people who are alive today are alive for the shift from the industrial model of working and living to what's new and what's the future and their place in it. And I feel very strongly that people today were living in such an amazing time everybody should be able to decide what they do with their lives. They're not restricted anymore by the things that have been holding human beings back for like thousands and thousands of years. I mean, the whole time that we've been on the planet. And so all of the work that I've done has been around condensing my 15 years of experience traveling the world and trying things out when there was absolutely no roadmap and even before, you know, before iPhones, before I even had a Facebook account, I mean, for a long time, and just always having that feeling of uncertainty. And I know that that's what made my journey take longer. And it went a lot slower than it can happen now. And so my like life goal for the foreseeable future is to help as many people as possible make that shift as fast as possible because technology is changing exponentially fast and the people who get to decide to become digital nomads right now or however they want to live their lives, they have the tools at their disposal to be able to do it. And so it doesn't make sense for people to just keep waiting around for permission. So I want to be the one to give people that permission because when I was growing up, I failed all of the career tests in middle school and high school. No one could ever match me with a job. My career counselor when I was a freshman in college had told me that my ideas were crazy because I said I wanted to work in Italy for myself and like travel around. He's like, that's not a job, that's vacation. And then I just kept getting no's from everybody. People were like, be a doctor, be a lawyer, like do this. And I was like, no, none of that is a good fit. And so of course I ended up listening to them 
going to school, going to grad school. And then in grad school, in my business school, where you're supposed to be guaranteed a job, basically, our career counselor in business school quit during the first semester. So there I was with student loans at 21, 22 in my MBA program, and I was spending for myself to find a job again. And so now in hindsight, looking back, it's like, wow, everything that happened led to to this and and now to have the ability to help people like seize the day basically and do it now is just a real honor. So it's just kind of, I know I'm doing a lot of things at the moment with the book and the YouTube channels and blogging and courses in the group, but it's all centered around the same thing, which is helping people to overcome the old paradigm of how we've lived for thousands of years and to just embrace what is possible and make it their own. Because I think that there's as many different ways to become a digital nomad as there are people in the world. And so the Facebook community is one way to do that with people one-on-one just for free. Yeah. I mean, that's amazing. That's what I want you to sort of maybe if you can just share and sort of explain that part of it. I mean, this is a a Facebook group, which pe- listeners of The Maverick Show, if they want to, could just join it for free and be a part of that community for free. And then what is... Can you just say what the community is and like what their experience would be joining your long-term digital nomad success group on Facebook? Uh, yes. So it, the idea for that came out of seeing a lot of misinformation on Reddit Digital Nomad and in different groups and different forums. And I just thought I'm going to create my own group because at least I know that the information I'm sharing is accurate and I can have some control over that. And so the group is for anybody who is... It started as aspiring digital nomads. So anybody who's interested in the idea of remote work, but they're intimidated by entering a group that has like 50,000 people or something like that and maybe people are like criticizing each other or I don't know, there's a lot of back and forth going on. And so this group is like a family. So I call it the long-term digital nomad success family. And it's just a really positive, encouraging group of people who are accepting of anyone from any country, of any background, who's interested in traveling or working remotely or starting their own business and having autonomy over their lives as adults. And so we do that by, well, I share a lot of my nerdy (laughs) research findings and lots of tips from travel to remote work. I share that on a daily basis, anything that I come across that I think is worth sharing. And then the other people in the group post questions and they post ideas for feedback. Um, They give each other help. And also I do a live stream every week, either with just me or with somebody else. It could be talking about insurance, for example, or financial stuff or travel tips or how to be successful as a freelancer, how to get clients for your business, tips for getting remote jobs, anything that's going to support people on this journey. And it's as much about giving examples of what people can do as it is about teaching. Because I think a lot of people learn through stories and they learn through seeing what other people are doing and kind of taking what resonates with them. And yeah, they just learn through a community. And so that's what I wanted to build. Yeah. And I think one of the things that's been amazing just, you know, as a participant of the group myself is to see how, I mean, there are now thousands of people in this group and there's people from all over the world. And a lot of people that come into the group are people that don't have a community around them of supportive folks that are doing this, right? They don't know people that are doing this. Maybe their friends and family are telling them you're crazy or you shouldn't or you can't or whatever. And they come into your group and they introduce, you know, you sit, you ask them to introduce themselves and they do. And, and then everybody's very supportive of them. They can ask questions and they can basically be around in an environment of thousands of people that are either doing this or trying to get into it and everybody's supportive of each other. And so I, I think that's just such an amazing environment. It's totally free. And what we're going to do is definitely put the link for that in the show notes as well. If people want to check out your Facebook group and join that at no cost, for sure, which I would encourage everybody to do if they're in any way interested in that. But I also want to talk about some of the other stuff you've been doing. You just actually, I mean, as a really, really more specific thing to really help people get jump started, you just recently launched your course, the 30-Day Digital Nomad Challenge. Can you talk a little bit about how that came about 
what that is and who that is for. Yes. So that was actually born out of having the group, funny enough, because once it got to a certain size, I mean, I answer everybody individually, but once it got to a certain size, uh, I realized that I was back in the same predicament uh, that I had with my relocation consulting company where you know, you can only help so many people per day with with questions. And so I kept getting the same questions over and over. And most of them were geared around how to start, like where to start on this very undefined, overwhelming concept of transitioning from a traditional conventional lifestyle to one of location independence, especially when all of the people around you don't understand it don't encourage it and don't condone it. And so I realized that I had to come up with a framework to help people. It couldn't just be one-on-one. It had to be serving people in a better way. And so over the course of like six months and with writing my book and going through so much research and putting together my own concepts, I decided to draw out the most important things that I thought would only be important for people who are starting. And this is also based on giving workshops and getting questions in a group setting. And I created this thing called the Digital Nomad Challenge. So it's like a jumpstart to working remotely. And it's basically like pouring jet fuel over the idea of becoming a digital nomad because it's the things that you might find out in the first like two years or three years of the process of trying to become a digital nomad, but you're getting fed one exercise per day every morning for 30 days that is specifically designed and building on each day prior to help you become a digital nomad. So it's not like from day one you until 30, you become a digital nomad and you're like, flying somewhere away, you know, but you'll have all of the tools at your disposal that after that 30 days is up, you'll, you'll have your mindset correct. Like we spend a whole week just on different um, mindset exercises and strategies, because that's always the biggest thing holding people back is fear. And then also remote jobs and online business, creating your own job. What are even the different options for people? How do they figure out what they should do? Like, what should they do for work? How should they support themselves? And then once all of those questions are answered, should they travel? Where should they go? How much should they travel? How do they budget for travel? How much money should they have saved? Um, Should they go by themselves? Should they go with a group or a retreat? And there's like all of these other questions that come up. And so we do travel in the fourth week and then also community because, of course, we're human beings. So we need community. So this Digital Nomad Challenge is designed with themes, one per week for four weeks and like non-invasive way. You know, you just can spend a few minutes on it every day. But it's all about working smarter and not harder. So instead of stressing yourself out and Googling questions for like the next 16 months or something like that before you take the first step to becoming a digital nomad, it's like you don't even have to search for the answers. They're getting sent to you every day on email. And then there's a Slack group where people can um, have that community feel and like share what they found out, share what they uncovered about themselves, share their answers and support other people. And then I'm in there answering questions as well and doing um, a live stream to like answer more questions from the group. So it's been really fun. This is the first one that we've done, but anyone will be able to join from now on. So it's been very like humbling to see the progress. And it's like everything that I ever dreamed of. It's everything I ever wanted to help people with. And it's actually happening. So it's been a very profound experience for me too. That's so awesome. We are going to link uh, that up in the show notes as well. And I think it's really, really significant because there's a lot of people who are interested and they listen and they want to do it and they're sort of aspiring to do it. But it's just this kind of, there's this indefinite timeline, right? There's just this kind of paralysis of, you know, just, oh, at some point I'll eventually do it or whatever. And so what I love about the way that you structured this is that it's a defined 30-day period 
to do exactly what you said, which is pour, you know, gasoline on it and really get you to do a committed progression in a short period of time to take you from where you are now to a much further place along your journey. And so I think that's really significant for people that are at that level. And they say, you know what, I'm really ready to do this. I need help. I need information. I need, you know, somebody to work with me on it, but I'm ready to do that. And I'm ready to do it now. And uh, I, I think that's a really, really significant contribution. So we're going to link up to that in the show notes as well. And then the other thing that you've recently launched is the Badass Digital Nomads podcast, which I was super honored to be a guest on. And we recorded that epic interview in Brazil, which was absolutely an amazing night. And I remember it so fondly and my memory was incredible. But you have been also interviewing some really incredible powerhouse, super interesting, super dynamic people on the podcast. So can you talk a little bit about how the podcast came about and what you're doing with the show and so forth? Yeah. So as soon as I found out really what podcasts were a few years ago, I knew I had to have one (laughs) because I just love, um, I love talking and connecting with people. And so many times throughout my life with I have some amazing friends and I've met so many cool people while traveling. And before I learned how to use a video camera, or in this case, podcast recording equipment, um, I would say I wish I had a GoPro strapped to my head and we were like recording this conversation. Because you just get exposed to so many different points of view and, and things when you're traveling in different countries. And so The original idea was to make it something like some of the ideas I was throwing around were um, Digital Nomad Digest, just to kind of provide like examples of people of how they became digital nomads. And it transformed into badass digital nomads. Because again, I think that so all of my clients, the number one thing that they say once they relocate is... I wish I did that sooner. And some of them wait five or 10 years before doing it. And so the whole idea is to help people have the courage to make these decisions faster, whether they're going to actually move to a different country or whether they want to quit their job or whether they want to start their own business, whatever it is, there's usually something holding us back. And it only takes one thing that you hear that triggers something that makes you take that first step. And as we know from psychology and research on motivation and productivity and procrastination, that action begets motivation. And so just one little thing can can inspire somebody to take that first step and then that first step can snowball. So the idea for Badass Digital Nomads is to interview people on all the different ways that they've transitioned from a nine to five to location independence. So they come from all different backgrounds, different ages, different industries. Some of them are self-employed. Some of them are freelancers. Some of them run e-commerce stores. Um, Some are remote employees. And everyone's doing different things. And they're all different ages. And it's just to show what's possible. So I had you as a guest on there. I had Polly Bo, who was our shared podcast guest, who shows that you can become a digital nomad in your 50s. I've had people who went from making $10 an hour or two cents per word as freelance writers who now have massive online businesses and hundreds of thousands of followers in their audience. I had a single mom come on from Germany and she talked about how she quit her job in theater and now she is a really successful YouTuber with online courses and she does voice coaching. So there's so many different stories out there. And the the goal of Badass Digital Nomads is to share those stories and also to bring on experts in the remote work industry because people are paying attention to remote work, but there's not any place, any one source where you can go to kind of stay on the cutting edge of what's going on. And things are changing really fast. So I want to bring in people from different remote companies, people who are creating products and services for digital nomads to solve problems that we have and that continue to come out of the woodwork as this uh, community evolves. And so yeah, that's really what it's about. 
Yeah, I'm subscribed to it, of course. And uh, it's really, really an awesome podcast. So we're going to link up to that in the show notes as well. So people can go check it out. And then I know one of the other things that was really cool that you did since the last episode is that you were the keynote speaker at the Nomad Summit in Las Vegas. And it was really cool because I was one of the keynotes at the Nomad at the 2018 Nomad Summit in Chiang Mai. And then they expanded the Nomad Summit and did a second one outside of Chiang Mai in Las Vegas. And they had you keynote that one. And I was not at the one that you spoke at, but I would love to hear about, you know, what was your talk about and what was that experience like for you? Um, Yes. So I was invited by Johnny, who is the founder of Nomad Summit. And it's funny because it just goes to show how tight knit the Nomad community is or is becoming. Before 2018, I did not know any digital nomads and the amount of collaborations and friendships and opportunities that have come out of my intentional year of meeting as many digital nomads as possible has just been mind boggling. And digital nomads are creating their lives. They're like creating their lifestyles. They're also creating their own opportunities for themselves and for others. And they're solving problems for people as they arise. So it's really like the digital nomad community is like a cloud nation of crowdsourced people in this kind of gig freelance economy. And it's so dynamic and it's so interesting. And so the way that that happened was really meeting Johnny at a hostel in Spain before we went on the nomad cruise. And then we traveled with a group of nomads in Greece and we became friends, decided to split off and go to Bulgaria together because everybody was kind of breaking into smaller groups as time went on. And we just became friends and he asked me to come on the podcast and we did some mastermind stuff together. And then he asked me to speak at the Nomad Summit on how to create a digital nomad relocation plan, which is like a thing that didn't even exist before, you know? And so I took my relocation experience and adapted it to what you would need as a digital nomad to basically create your own escape plan um, and to be able to travel the world while working. And so it's something that you can implement one time or you can do it every time you change to a new destination. So that's what I spoke about at Nomad Summit. And it was great. So I did a talk on creating your digital nomad relocation plan. And that was like my first really talk in an audience that big. And then I also did a workshop on sustaining the digital nomad lifestyle um, later on in the weekend. And both of those experiences have also contributed to the idea for badass digital nomads and like making it more interactive because of the nature of the digital nomad community. And so that's why, for example, I do the podcast. A lot of the episodes are live on YouTube because I really love that interaction with the audience or with the viewers or with the listeners so that they can like ask questions in real time and just be like a part of the process of designing their own lifestyles. Yeah, for sure. I think the Nomad Summits are such important meetup events for people that are already doing the Nomad thing and aspiring nomads to just meet and hang out in person because it just gives such a another level of depth beyond what the virtual communities are able to do. So mm-hmm. I, I'm a big fan of that event and uh, they're doing it twice a year now. I just had Johnny on the show a couple episodes ago and uh, in 2019, they're going to do the second Nomad Summit in Mexico this year. And then they, of course, always do the flagship uh, January event in Chiang Mai. So we'll put the link to that in the show notes as well if anybody wants to check out either of the Nomad Summit events, but highly, highly recommend it. It's a, it's a really... A really good time and uh, a really, really cool place to meet uh, pretty amazing people in person. Yes. I just want to give a shout out to Johnny because he has such good vibes. I know he's been on your show a couple of times. And so for anyone who's listening, who's thinking of going to an in real life conference or event, I highly recommend the Nomad Summit because it's just an extension of like Johnny's personality, in my opinion. And it's so different. You know, I think the digital nomad community is a lot different from 
other kind of subcultures within business because it really is such a sharing economy. It's like everybody realizes that it's not a zero sum game and everybody just sharing information together and helping each other, I think is bringing up the entire community. And it's just like so inclusive. Like everybody is allowed in the digital nomad community. And so, yeah, I just wanted to say like, if anyone wants to do that, come on over and join whatever floats your boat because it's just so welcoming. I would love at this point, Kristen, for you to maybe talk a little bit about, you've alluded to your relocation business. And the last episode, we talked a lot about how you initially developed the business and you started with a really tight niche, which was professional poker players. And we went through that entire story in episode three, and it's an amazing story. And I encourage everybody to go listen to episode three who has not yet to hear that story. But I would love to hear on this episode how you transitioned from the niche of professional poker players to a broader relocation company and how you developed Orbis, which is your broader relocation company, and what that does and how you run that business remotely. It's really important as a location independent entrepreneur or remote worker, when you're working from home, you really need to have contact with other people in real life as well as online. And so right after I started Poker Refugees, so this was 2011. In the first couple of years, it was mostly poker players because it was such a, a niche business. But I think after maybe the word kind of got out through mainstream media and this concept of lifestyle design and the four hour work week just continued growing in popularity over the years and was becoming more mainstream. Somehow people found me on the internet because most relocation companies are for corporations or retirees. I would say that's like the primary relocation companies or maybe for families, but usually for corporate employees. And so I was one of the few people who was offering like individual relocation services for just normal people. So I started getting inquiries from like personal trainers and therapists and all sorts of different um, sole proprietors. And they were asking if I could help them, even though they weren't poker players. And I was like, yeah, for sure. It's the same process, just a few different things. And it's actually less specialized if you're not a professional gambler, because Um, They have like a set, a separate set of needs in addition to that. So I decided I wanted to help them too. I was like, I'm not going to turn these people away. Like I can totally help them. And I don't even play poker myself. So I started helping, yeah, everybody, personal trainers, software developers, couples who were, had their own business together, all sorts of different people. And so that's why I had my original company was called Orbis Relocation, but then poker and sports refugees were like the sub brands of that. And so I decided to make Orbis Relocation my flagship brand still just for regular people. So I I have also done corporate relocations as well, but I just focus on helping people who who want some one on one guidance when they're moving to a different country and they don't just want to like figure it out and do a sink or swim sort of thing. That's awesome. You and I were also talking about uh, travel experiences and adventures and snafus and all that kind of stuff along the way. I know a lot of the, the founding of these companies and stuff was when you were spending a lot of time in Central America. And we were talking about uh, you know the time we both spent time separately in Nicaragua and all that kind of stuff. And I was wondering if you could tell a little bit um, about your time in Nicaragua and how that went and uh, some of the uh, travel adventures that you had there. Yeah, I mean, living abroad as an expat from the age of 19, 19 or 20, I think is when I started. I mean, talk about learning the hard way. (laughs) It's really the learning curve is so steep and it is at any age. So I just came into it with this like blissful ignorance and it was a fun time, but it was also a bumpy road at times. And I think my first time getting ripped off was like paying this guy $80 to help me find an apartment when I was, yeah, like 19 years old living in Australia. And he just like took the money and never helped me. And I ended up finding my apartment in the classifieds of a newspaper. So, you know, it started very early and then that continued. And Costa Rica and Nicaragua were kind of known as like the wild, wild west of real estate because you didn't necessarily, you didn't need to be licensed to do real estate there. There was no sort of multiple listing system 
it was very unorganized. And so even though there were laws, they're very difficult to enforce. And so a lot of people took advantage of that. And there were some shady business practices going on. So that was pretty shocking for me to see coming straight out of college and business school where everything's on the straight and narrow. And so I did like leave different companies throughout my career because I didn't feel like it aligned with like my values. And I took a risk to go to Nicaragua to help set up a brand new office in the middle of nowhere for a really big real estate franchise. And kind of like the same thing was happening. It was like, I don't know, I just didn't see eye to eye with like the broker. And I I felt like I wanted to do my own thing. But I got nudged into that really quickly during the elections of 2008. It was the municipal elections in Managua. And so Nicaragua already had an image problem and a branding problem because Danielle Ortega, who was like the president during the Civil War, got reelected like decades later to be the, the president again. And then in the elections of 2008, there was a lot of riots and protests because the Sandinista party was accused of stealing the election. And I still had some roots in Costa Rica while I was living in Nicaragua, but I was traveling back and forth between the countries just for fun and to visit friends and things. And during one of the trips, I think it was in, it must have been at the end of the year because it was the election. So I had already had like a pretty tough year like building this real estate office in the middle of nowhere, like all by myself with like only electricity part of the day. And it had just been like a really trying year for me. I was only 24 or 25 and I was already like stressed out and my entrepreneurial spirit was still strong. So I had all of these like side businesses and ideas that I was testing, like a t-shirt company and exporting dried fruit like pineapples and bananas and cashews and chia seeds and all sorts of things. So I was like running around doing all these errands. Um, I had a lot of balls in the air. And on one of the trips going from Costa Rica back to my like headquarters in northwestern Nicaragua, I got stuck in a big riot during those municipal elections. And at the time I had a a driver because the cost of living in Nicaragua is really low. So you can like services are really cheap. So I had like full-time maid and caretaker and gardener and driver. And so I'm sitting in the back minding my own business. This was right when iPhones came out. So I remember I was emailing somebody on my iPhone and I got this email from like my business partner in a non-real estate venture who was basically telling me that they were cutting me out of the business they had like gone behind my back to the suppliers that I sourced in Nicaragua and like basically like cut me out and then offered to hire me as like a sales agent or something for the company that I had started. So I'm like reading this email on my phone and I like hearing all of this stuff happening around me on the streets in Managua. But I'm thinking like I'm safe because like the driver is going to take care of it and he knows what he's doing. And the next thing I know, the driver just like, pulls over. It was kind of a traffic jam. He just gets out of the car and joins the riot. And so I'm just sitting in the back seat, like on my first generation iPhone, reading this email, like telling me that basically like my partner screwed me over. And then all of a sudden my driver is joining this riot out in like the middle of downtown Managua. And he just ran away. Like I literally never saw him again. And so I climb over into the front seat and like the key's still in the ignition and I just drive away and I didn't know where I was going because again, it's like pre Google Maps, you know, and I end up locked in a parking lot of a mall because like the only place I knew how to get to was like this really big mall. And so I got there and I was like, at least it's safe. It's somewhere I know. I know the neighborhood. And uh, I just went into the parking lot and then they closed the gates and I was just stuck there for hours in the car. And then it got dark and there are like people throwing cherry bombs and they have like fire on sticks and like picket signs. And it was just crazy and hectic. And then we talked the security guard to like letting me out of this parking lot. And I drove across the street to a hotel that I knew and I 
stayed there for like three days and all of the roads were blocked to get to my house, which was three hours away. And so I just had a lot of time to sit there and think in this hotel. And I was like, you know what? I'm too young for this. Like, I don't think that my life was directly threatened by the people. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. But I had to make a decision. I was like, what is this like career worth? Or like, what is life worth if it like ends so soon over something like so random? And I just felt like I had put myself in a really high risk situation that I was a little bit in over my head. And so after sitting in this hotel for three days, I decided that, you know, I already wasn't that happy in, in like my situation with my partners. And then I had these side businesses that were like falling apart and I just felt very alone in the world. And so I literally just drove back to Costa Rica because the the roads North were still blocked off. So I was like, I'm just going to go back to Costa Rica and figure it out. And so that's what I did. And I that's when I first decided, like, I'm going to work for myself from now on. I don't want to be at the mercy of these like other people and geopolitical forces and all of this craziness. And so I went back to Costa Rica. And then a couple months later, I went back to get my stuff from my house. (laughs) And once things had settled down and um, yeah, and actually I still own property in Nicaragua. It's such a beautiful country and I'm still friends with my former staff and team from our real estate office and they're just amazing people. But I feel really bad for the local people of Nicaragua because they've really been put through the ringer when it comes to the um, political situation. And I know there's been a lot of additional violence this year. So yeah, I would say that was like one of the craziest things that's ever happened to me while traveling. Yeah, I feel like the more we travel, I mean, you just, you know, you have all kinds of experiences, right? I mean, and they just, you learn from them and they shape you and, you know, they just sort of develop you as a person. And so I think it's amazing that you've had so many experiences and so many cultures and so many scenarios and you've been able to really, you know, harness all of those experiences together and and put them out into the world in ways that other people can, you know, learn from all of the, you know, collective sort of wisdom and lessons and everything that you've developed. And so I think it's amazing that you're doing that in all of these different content formats, um, you know, so people can really derive the maximum amount of value from all of your experiences. And I want to ask you a little bit about that too. I mean, just as you've been so prolific with your content creation, particularly over the last year, right? Like when we did the last interview, you were putting out content. But I feel like over the last year, you've just gone exponentially to a completely another level. And I want to ask you, first of all, just about personal brand building. Like That's the first category of question I want to ask you. If you can talk a little bit about what you've done, particularly over the last year, and any tips that you have for people in terms of content creation and prolific content creation with respect to building a personal brand? I think that everybody needs to consider building their own personal brand from now on. Because as we spoke about with the old model and the industrial model of work, the key to success was specializing in one thing. You know, you go work at your job or your factory for 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, and you do one thing and you do it really well and you move up the ranks and everything is good. Um, But today, robots can take your job or your job can get outsourced and there is very little job security. So the digital nomad and remote work revolution is really aligned with the end of specialization in jobs at least in some jobs. Of course, if you're a brain surgeon, you want to be specialized in that. But the way to succeed in the future and in the present right now is being able to combine different skills and different specialties into something that's new. So whether you're niching down to help a specific person or solve a specific service, or you just want to be more attractive to an employer, having a personal brand is so helpful. Because even if you're you're just applying for a remote job that you found online, of course, your resume or your CV are very important. Also, your LinkedIn profile, but also everyone's going to Google you now. So how you appear online it could impact whether you get a job or not. 
And it's even more important when you work for yourself because your clients are going to Google you. They're going to look for reviews. uh, They're going to look for other people who have worked for you. They're going to look for social proof. And so whether you're a software developer or a blogger or anything, having a personal brand is going to be really helpful. And so when I was developing my own personal brand, I was thinking, okay, well, it has to be me, you know, it has to be authentic. And I want a brand that is going to grow with me as a person throughout my career for the next however long, you know, for decades. And so I put a lot of thought behind traveling with Kristen. And I I say as like kind of a tagline that it's about traveling the world and life because Many people identify with their jobs and with their careers, but today we get to identify with something much more than that. And like our job can be an extension of our personality and our skill set and what our natural abilities are. And now we get to combine it with travel or being location independent and living wherever we want. And so it was really important for me to serve people to have credibility and like for people to get to know me and know that I'm legit. And so the only way that I could think of going forward is to just share who I was, what I did, so that, you know, I'm walking the talk. And so it was a very strategic decision, but also one that felt natural natural for me. And, um, and, and it was a good fit. Like having a podcast, um, making the videos writing the book, like these are all natural extensions of my personality. So for each person, it will be different. But a lot of people are saying now that the future belongs to the polymaths. So anybody who can combine their skills in a unique way and then market them is just going to make more money. And so I think that it's kind of a two-way street for people to think about not only how are they benefiting themselves, but like how are they benefiting the world at large and how are they securing their future? That is really, really good advice. I want to ask you about one more topic, which is that you have been, just to sort of preface this, you have been, as long as I've known you, a really hard worker. You've been hustling, you've been grinding, you've been building businesses, you've been making things happen. With that said, I feel like in the last six to 12 months, you have shifted gears and taken it up like three notches in terms of your productivity, in terms of how prolific your content production is. And just in terms of, you know, your overall net productivity, I feel like you, you've just taken it to another level and you've literally just done a gear shift. And I want to ask you about that. And what have you done differently and what have you learned and what does your current productivity routine, day structure, morning routine, all that kind of stuff look like? You know, the key for anybody listening who wants to do something but hasn't done it yet is twofold. It's first to make the decision that you're going to do it and to recognize that every moment, every breath, every day, every morning, any any minute, any second is the opportunity to change your mind or to make a decision to do something. And they, there's this saying that 100% is 100 times easier than 99%. And I think that's so true because in the moment of making the decision and deciding to go forward with whatever it is that you want to do, it just makes it, I don't want to say easier, but it just gives you momentum And it takes away the fear of doing it, the fear of acting. And so it's making the decision and then getting out of your own way and also taking small steps. So even though I appreciate that compliment, Matt, like I have been working really hard and I like, I thank you for for that, that you've, you know, noticed that I've been producing a lot of content because I do work a lot at it, but it's just taking things one step at a time and you know, realizing, celebrating small wins and realizing that you might not get there or wherever you're going overnight, but that you're just enjoying the process and you're learning a lot as you go. So once you make the decision that you're going to launch that business or you're going to travel or you're going to sell your house or whatever it is that you're doing, you just want to commit to it and then reverse engineer it and work backwards 
how are you going to do it? And so I've applied that to everything that I've done because just like anyone else, I get overwhelmed. I sometimes get unsure of myself. I get nervous. I get afraid. I wonder what people are going to think. I wonder if what I'm creating is good. I have all of the same doubts as as everybody else. But um, the, the thing that has kept me going is just whether it's a small project or a big project is just breaking it into really small steps. So whether it's editing a video or creating an online course or writing a book, I wrote my book in one chapter per day for six weeks. And the first draft was 95,000 words. <laughs> like It was a lot of words. Um, but it had been open as a project for a few years. And it wasn't until I decided I'm going to do it. And this is my deadline. Now, what do I need to do in between this timeline to get it done? And I just calculated it. Okay, I'm going to write for one to two hours per day or like a minimum of 2000 words. And then I just started doing it. And I micro focused on that one thing. And I didn't care, you know, how long it took. Even now the book's not published yet, but you can only focus on one thing at a time. So even if the first step to doing what you want to do is opening your computer or turning it on or opening the page of Google, just start with the very first step and break it down into like laughably small pieces so that you can not be intimidated by your own goals. And that's how I've just approached each next thing. And whenever I get stuck, your job is to find the answer. When you get stuck, the answer is always out there. And something helpful for me has been if I knew the answer, what would it be? (laughs) Or if I already knew how to do this, where would I start or what would I do first? Or if I knew someone who could help me, who would I ask for help? And it's like weird when you ask yourself in a way that takes the pressure off, all of these answers start to come and it's like a little brainstorming session. So big picture strategy, that's how it is. And it's not very sexy, but that's how I get through each day. And eventually whatever I'm working on is done. And then the other thing that has really helped me get to the next level and like change my life in a massive way is having a morning and an evening ritual where I check in on my goals. So I'm like obsessed with uh, with tracking my goals. So I have every morning I look at my full focus planner and I do a meditation and I do like a two minute entry in the daily stoic journal. And I look at my list for the day and I do my most important tasks and um, just focus on one thing at a time. And then at night, I open my full focus planner, which is like a series of questions that is like an end of the day check-in. And it's crazy how many ideas I've gotten and how many insights from doing like a daily review. So asking yourself, what did I read today? What did I hear today? What stood out? How am I feeling right now? Um, What can I do tomorrow to move forward on my goals? And it's just like chipping away at your goals and like doing little steps and then That wrapped in with the full focus planner, which is like quarterly goals and annual goals, helps me stay on track. And then weekly, I'm part of a mastermind. So every Monday morning, we do a one hour phone call where we review what we committed to do last week, give ourselves like a progress report, and then we announce our commitment of what we're going to do the following week. And you are actually. 76.7% more likely to achieve your goals when you write them down and you share it with a friend, even if your friend doesn't care about the goal. So I think the biggest thing besides breaking down my projects into tiny pieces is to keep my goals top of mind on a daily basis. So twice a day in the morning when I start my day in the afternoon or the evening when I finish my day and um, in sharing goals and then Also setting like public goals so that you're publicly accountable. Like one of our mutual friends got me to do a 90 day live stream. And so once I announced it, I had to do a live stream for 90 days. And like, that's terrifying. So it's like just getting out of your own way and doing things and like not caring what the outcome is and what people think. And then all of a sudden it becomes a part of who you are and um, you just keep going. And so, but of course, having fun along the way. So it doesn't mean every day is easy, but if I could give anybody some tips, those are the things that I started doing in the past year that I had never done before. 
and it has apparently resulted <laughs> in a way that is noticeable. That is for sure. That's really, really good advice. All right, Kristen, at this point, are you ready for the lightning round? I'm ready, Matt. Let's do it. The lightning round. All right. What is one travel hack that you can share with people that you use? My newest travel hack is an app called Time Shifter, and it helps fight jet lag. So it will give you a plan leading up to your trip of what time to sleep, what time to drink caffeine, what time of day to get light exposure, when to wear sunglasses, and it helps prevent jet lag. Awesome. I need to get that. What is one travel gadget or item that you always love to travel with? I have two. One is any sort of laptop stand or laptop desk just for ergonomics and posture. I I literally can't work without one of those now. And then the other one would be a Wi-Fi device. So you always want to have a backup Wi-Fi device. There are different types, whether it's an unlocked generic one or through one of the brands like NAMI or Skyroam or TEP Wireless. Awesome. What is one tip that you can give for staying healthy and staying fit while you're traveling or if you're moving around as an itinerant nomad? The biggest tip is to slow travel because inevitably, if you're going too fast, you're just going to be dealing with too many urgent and not important things to be able to focus on your health. So slow travel. And then when you are slow traveling, my number one tip would be to watch out for your alcohol intake because it's really easy to drink socially when you're meeting new people or you're around other people who are on vacation or other travelers. So alcohol is a depressant. And if you are traveling too much, eating out at restaurants and drinking too much, it's going to catch up with you really fast. All right. What is one lesson that you've learned from interviewing all of these badass digital nomads on your podcast, from all those conversations and all those people that you've met and interacted with that are in this lifestyle? What is one thing that you have learned from them? I've learned how amazingly unique each person is and how regular people's stories that you haven't heard of can be much more inspiring than some like business guru like Tony Robbins. So that's why I like to have just regular people on my show because I think everybody has something to share. Everybody has a skill, even if they don't know about it. And it can usually help a lot of other people out. Awesome. Last question. Knowing everything that you know now and everything you've experienced in life up to this point, if you were able to go back in time and give one piece of advice to your 18-year-old self, what would you say to 18-year-old Kristen? I would tell her not to listen to all of the naysayers, that you have your ideas and you have your inner desires and dreams for a reason and to follow them through and see where they lead. Because the more you listen to other people, the longer you're going to delay your own destiny and living your life. That is awesome advice. All right, Kristen, I want you to tell people how they can get a hold of you, follow you, get into your universe and consume your content. And everything you say, we're going to link up in the show notes at themaverickshow.com. So uh, you can just go to one place if you want all the links, but go ahead and tell them how they can find you. So the easiest way would probably be traveling with Kristen on YouTube and Instagram and my website, which is travelingwithkristin.com. And then there's also youtube.com slash digital nomad is my digital nomad TV channel. So that's where you can get more of like the nitty gritty and the technical stuff on how to become a digital nomad. And you can also participate in the live recordings of the Badass Digital Nomads podcast. And so um, the podcast is also available on 
iTunes and Google Play and Spotify and should be everywhere soon. But you can also look up Badass Digital Nomads and you can join our free Facebook family, Long-Term Digital Nomad Success. And that is also linked from my website as well. So come hang out. It is an awesome place to hang out. I can vouch for that. And we're going to link everything up at themaverickshow.com in the show notes for this episode. So you can just go there and find all the links to Kristen's stuff. Kristen, thank you so much for being on the show. It was so wonderful to have you here again. Thank you for having me back. And I hope that next time we are sitting somewhere in an exotic destination with a bottle of wine. Let's make that happen for sure. All right. Good night, everybody. Be sure to visit the show notes page at themaverickshow.com for direct links to all the books, people, and resources mentioned in this episode. You'll find all that and much more at themaverickshow.com. If you like podcasts, you will love audiobooks, and you can get your first one for free at themaverickshow.com slash audiobook. Whether you want the latest best-selling novels or books on investing, business, or travel, try your first audiobook for free at themaverickshow.com forward slash audiobook. Would you like to get Maverick Investor Group's white paper on real estate investing for digital nomads? How to buy U.S. rental properties from anywhere in the world and finance an epic international lifestyle?